So next lecture, it's a pleasure to have Sergei Kuzienko, who will tell us, give us three lectures about extended supersymmetric signal models in superspace and hypercurrier geometry. Thank you. Um, it's pleasure to be here. I was asked to give the original lectures on uh, supersymmetric signal models and uh, and extended supersymmetric signal models and hypercurrier geometry. And uh, I gave similar lectures two years ago at a school in which the audience consisted both of mathematicians and physicists, and at that time I didn't assume any background. But this time I said, well, because it's not it, I said, well, I will assume knowledge of NX1 supersymmetric field theory at basic level, provided in book, say, by Vias uh, and Bagel, if you study books by Bizarro uh, Logic and Sigilis, big Bizarro Logic, that's more than now. But well, I, now I see that there are so many mathematicians and in this audience probably my decision was wrong. But anyway, this is how I uh, structured my lecture notes. Uh, I mean, if you need an introduction to uh, basic symmetric theory, I can. Uh, I can give you less in detail. So, uh, talking about uh, uh, n equals two supersymmetric signal models is difficult. N equals, well, uh, I will only discuss signal models in four dimensions. So, in four dimensions, we can have n equals one supersymmetric signal models and n equals two. That's it. So, when we go down, well, uh, we have, say, in two dimensions, we can have three, uh, n equals three, n equals four supersymmetry. So, but I prefer to live in four dimensions. So it's difficult to talk about that this subject because it's a very old subject. It goes back to 1981. But at the same time, it is new subject because research in this field is still going on. <coughs> and new results have been produced. And so, uh, and in my opinion, the best presentation of supersymmetric sigma model, models make use of superspace. Because uh, reasons are reasons in the given. So, uh, three lectures will. Um, so, we have three lectures. First lecture will be basically about uh, formulation of n equals two supersymmetric sigma models in n equals one superspace. So, uh, this formulation is very useful from geometric point of view, but this formulation doesn't allow us to generate sigma models. Second lecture will be about sigma models in n equals 2 superspace. Uh, manifest is, well, it's about manifest supersymmetric formulations. It's a bit more advanced topic, and why we need such formulations because they allow us to generate sigma And last lecture will be about sigma models in ADS, this is subject that appeared this year. Uh, in 2011, many people were interested in subsymmetric field theories on pure backgrounds, like on the seated background. So, but uh, Zabir and collaborators, they started um, a more fancy background. So, and we analyzed um, both general signal models with n equals two supersymmetry in ADS. And so last lecture will be basically about uh, sigma models in ADS background. And that formalism of present uh, can be used to uh, construct sigma models in more general background. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and coming back to the title, I was asked to put hyperfield geometry in time. I'm not expert on geometry. I'm supersymmetry practitioner. So uh, I use a geometry in mathematics only well in a physics way, only to the extent we need. So I plan this for that. So geometry well I'll show how geometry will appear in sigma model uh, context. I'll show how extended supersymmetry will demand extended uh, hyperfield geometry. So, uh, 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 extended, uh, well, uh, extended supersymmetry has given us many nice results. And in my opinion, one of the best, one of the most profound results is 
one-to-one -one correspondence between n equals two symmetric nonlinear sigma models and uh, uh, hyperkeller manifold. This result goes back to 1981 when Alvarez, Gamay, and Friedman discovered that target spaces all extend well as uh, well super supersymmetric sigma models with eight superchannels. Uh, must be hyperkeller manifolds. This eight supercharges in dimensions from three to six. Or with, with fixed supercharges in dimension three. So well uh, two dimension is also good, but two dimensions uh, give give more options. So I'm not going to discuss two dimensions for X unity. And so what is remarkable is that that discovery took place only two years after Einstein's uh, Centennial year. Uh, well, uh, Einstein would be 100 years old, but two remarkable discoveries happened the same year. Uh, uh, Zumina discovered uh, intimate relationship between a Keller geometry and sub, uh, rigid subsymmetric sigma models in the And in the same year, Kalavi put forward the concept of hyper Keller geometry. Uh, so, um, so because of this correspondence, I mean, uh, well, that correspondence between sigma models and hyperfield geometry was one of the one of the main motivations to study more detail, more detail sigma models. And of course, if uh, be, uh, well, you know that the best setting for supersymmetric theories is superspace, so it's natural to develop a uh, super. Um, a superfield approaches to sigma models, but this is not the main reason why uh, I want to do sigma models in superspace. The main reason is the following conceptual idea that actually formulations of n equals two supersymmetric sigma models in n equals two superspace allow us to generate hyperkähler metrics. And ideally, Ideally, we can generate arbitrary hyperkähler matrix if we have access to, if we are able to construct more general sigma models. Why is that? Because of this theory. So one-to-one, one-to-one correspondence between sigma models and hyperkähler manifolds. So if we, well, uh, in superspace we can build uh, actions, supersymmetric theories, starting, well, using uh, Lagrangian, that's Lagrangian, that's an arbitrary function. So we take in Lagrangian, derive the theory, we read off a target space metric, and by construction it is hyperkähler. I'll give example of uh, application of this idea. Of course, uh, well, free breakfast don't exist. There is always price to pay, and I'll explain um, uh, well, so technical issues that we have to address when working with manifest supersymmetric sigma models. So this idea was put forward by several people, including Ulf Lindström in this audience, with Martin Rolchik. Then there was uh, uh, there are several works uh, of people from Dogma, jointly with Paul Townsend. And then uh, well, so the first collaboration was joined by uh, Nigel Hitchin and Dave Randy. Uh, very important work. So this uh, this was an idea. And, well, it has been implemented in different aspects over years, and this is still story in progress, work in progress. So new and new results being produced, and that's why I think it is natural to talk to talk about this story to this mathematical audience. Now. Uh, so what are n equals two supersymmetric sigma models? They were basically well, simple definition. They describe n well uh, self-interacting. Uh, they describe self-interacting a uh, hypermodules. Self-interaction is up to two derivatives, and there exist three off-shell formulations for uh, charge hypermodules. Uh, for charge hypermodules, that is most important for sigma models. For sigma model uh, application, charge hypermultiplet means that it can it, it can it can be used to describe superfluidity. So
So it is, its structure is compatible with U1 phase symmetry. And it means that such multiplet can be coupled to superior males in an arbitrary representation of the Vedic group. And there is also neutral hypermultiplets that cannot be used to describe a super QED. Uh, so I will give you a few examples below. So there is three uh, of shell formulation. The oldest one is formulation due to Fahim Sonius. It is a very short multiplet. It has 8 plus 8 degrees of freedom. And that's good. And this multiplet uh, is used in, in most applications, including Zyberg Witness Field. So uh, the formulation Zyberg uh, Witness is used for strategic reasons. Uh, Fahim Sonius hypermultiplet. They never said that, but it was Fahim Sonius hypermultiplet. Just about notation, uh, 8 plus 8 means bosons fragments? Yes, yeah. yeah. 8 bosonic and 8 So this, uh, this uh, multiplet is very short. The only disadvantage of that multiplet, it has intrinsic, intrinsic central charge. It gets deformed when you go from model to model. And so this formulation is not really good for applications. So the second... Uh, Multiplet that was introduced in the context of harmonic superspace is called Q plus hypermultiplet. So it has, unlike previous uh, multiplet, it has in infinitely many degrees of freedom. It is very good for constructing models, but there is price to pay when we use this multiplet. Uh, price to pay, we have to eliminate infinitely many arguments. <laughs> And there is one more multiplet that was introduced in the context of projective superspace by Linton Rochik. It's called polar hypermultiplet. It also has infinitely many degrees of freedom. It's slightly shorter than the first one. They are related, but they are different. Uh, and this multiplet is, uh, in my opinion, ideal for sigma model application. For sigma model application. So now, uh, so the first multiplet is, well, Fayasonius multiplet is uh, good in the sense that we can, uh, 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 well, it's actually, well, when we realize it in Enkelsam superspace, this multiplet uh, consists of two kinds of superspace. And most general sigma models with n equals to supersymmetry can, can be formulated in terms of in terms of a Kyle and the one superfield, this was done by Hal, Hal Petrin from Rochik. And this, their formulation will be reviewed in today's lecture. Um, and their formulation can be viewed as consistent self-interaction of the form of uh, Um So, uh, the most general uh, n equals two supersymmetric sigma model can be also formulated in terms of polar multiplets. So uh, the main idea was given by Linton Rochik in 88. And my lectures are held. The first and second lectures will, will be about, will be about uh, these two formulations and the relationship. So, okay, what about harmonic superspace approach? We can also use uh, to construct more general sigma model, but we do not know how to relate that approach to formulation in terms of n equals 1 superfluid. And then you can ask the question, why should we care about formulation in terms of n equals 1 superfluid? Well, there are three reasons. First of all, Hyosonius uh, multiplet has the uh, uh, smallest number of, of degrees of freedom. It is geometric. So when we have sigma model formulated in terms of n equal one superfields, uh, all geometrics, well, input is in there. And more importantly, more importantly, that formulation is in fact n equals two of shell. That property is not well known, but um, <coughs> so it's like when you, when you have sigma model formulated in terms of bosonic fields, we know that supersymmetry algebra is not closed. No activity. So when we take n equals two sigma model and formulate in terms of n equals one superfields, okay, it looks like only one supersymmetry is there, but actually uh, this well, second symmetry supersymmetry is uh, uh, 
I, well, I will expect it to be closed only on shell. This is not correct. And this formulation actually is off shell if you properly define uh, second supersymmetric summation. Now, all that was about charge pattern. As I said, uh, there exists also a neutral pattern. Uh, formulations for neutral type of multiplier and actually infinitely many formulations. Uh, well, one family, one of family, one family of off shell formulations for neutral hyper multiplier is finding in many number of auxiliaries. Well, well, that family has the name of real O to N multiplets. N goes from two, three, so just different multiplets. They differ by number of auxiliaries. And, I mean, uh, you can formulate some sigma models in terms of such multiplets, but not more general. And of course, uh, the oldest mul neutral multiplet is so-called relaxed multiplet. So when that work appeared, it was just um, like revolution, because it was the first formulation for hypermultiplet without auxiliaries, without central charge, sorry. Uh, that multiplet, uh, uh, by now, in my opinion, has only a historical significance. It's gone. It's not useful for quantum calculations. It's not useful for uh, sigma model calculations. Now, uh, now, uh, well, um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to discuss briefly formulation of, uh, phi, well, just properties of Fayette-Sonius multiplet. I need this property in properties in order to motivate second structure of second supersymmetry transformation in, in, in this setting. And then, and then I turn to uh, sigma models in standard sigma models in uh, n equal one superspace. So what what I, uh, what is necessary in order to formulate fire solids multiple we need um, n equals two covariant derivatives. So covariant derivatives uh, in n equals to superspace, n equals to superspace uh, is parameterized in terms of four bosonic variables, uh, Grassmann variables, theta is two component index alpha and SU2 index i, and uh, the conjug conjugate uh, variables, and so alpha and alpha dot just to component spinner index and I take values well in just SU2 index. We have two n equals two supersymmetry, two sets of Grassmann variables. So I use the following conjugation rule. So uh, with respect to uh, under complex conjugation index <coughs> SU2 index I goes upstairs and what is the signature of space time? Is it Minkowski? I, 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 I use the same notation as in the book by uh -huh. Bagger. Okay, thank you. And the only uh, one more notation or convention I have to mention. I let index i take two values, one and two, and i on the line. Because in some, at some stage I need just to work with second or first component and just uh, to make it clear that it's not power or the index and on the line. Okay, um, we have uh, n equals to supersymmetry with central charge. Here we have covariant derivatives. And covariant, well, uh, supersymmetry generators look very similar, but is I inserted and uh, ch uh, signs change in some places. So, Fayer Sonius. Uh, Hypermultiplet is defined this way. It is described by uh, either spinner, uh, living on n equals to superspace, and obeying spatial constraints. So we hit Q, we hit Q with D, symmetrize SU2 indexes, get zero. We hit Q with D bar, symmetrize uh, SU2 indexes, get zero. And the same is true for conjugate Fire Sonia's uh, hydromet multiplet is necessarily complex. Uh, um, so here, um, yeah, I mean, so this is definition of conjugate. 
And when we raise and lower a CO2 incident, there is one tricky point to keep in mind. So when you, uh, so we get, uh, so we start from QI with I low position, conjugate and get Q bar I with upper position. So, but then instead of QI, I mean, then I can just uh, raise index and conjugate, and then I get extra sign. And extra sign because of property epsilon ij conjugate with minus epsilon ij. And the reason for that is that epsilon ij is up and lower indices, they are in your surface. Okay, that's it. Now, uh, a very simple constraint. Uh, on previous uh, slide, you remember that uh, covariant derivatives involve central charge. What is central charge? Uh, what is, uh, how is that operator defined? The point is that it's not defined at all, originally. So its explicit action on Q follows from the constraint. We cannot, we cannot say that uh, delta acting on Q is plus Q or minus. If you do that, we, get, we put multiplet on shell. Uh, so this operator is not defined originally. But then we just we have constraints. We play with constraints. Oh, one more point I missed. Uh, uh, so the algebra of covariant derivatives involves a complex parameter double. W is, uh, well, just complex of unit norm. It can be made anything on unit set. You can choose it to be a 1 or i or minus 1 or minus i. It's up to you. Different people use different conventions, different definitions. You can always uh, change the value of W if you like. I'm just by blind faces and such. But since uh, well, I just... I'm, Given pedagogical lectures, I decided to keep W, and uh, it's kind of fake, and you will see specific places where W, w occurs, and so those contributions will be on physical. So, but, uh, I mean, if you like, you can put it just, you can uh, make it equal to 1 or I. Anyway, uh, so uh, we have the constraints, we can play with constraints, we, can, we derive a lot of identities. And in particular, from this identity, we can deduce that delta acting on spin derivative of Q is, well, vector derivatives on the same object, but of opposite kind. So basically, the action of a central charge on our multiplet is determined by the constraint. And now, if we use this result, repeat them again, we, we end up with something like that. You see, this is the first time the condition that W has unit norm is used. And this result means that uh, delta squared acting on uh, our multiplet is not new. It's expressed in terms of Bellambert. And so this equation can be interpreted as wave equation in five, in, in five dimensions, so we can just think of central charge as, as uh, derivative in extra dimension. Now, uh, so there is a lot of information encoded in constraints. And one way to uh, understand that information is to go down to n equals 1 superspace. Multiplet is formulated in terms of n equals 2 superspace. Now, let me just uh, look, well, just uh, follow brute force approach and just write down all, all constraints. And just, I, well, so here the constraints, I just consider all possible values for i, j. And now, well, we should keep in mind that well, n equals two superfields depend on two sets of graph on the <coughs> Theta one, theta two, and the conjugates. And so what the cons these constraints tell us particular is that dependence of Q on the variable theta 2 and theta bar 2 is completely determined in terms of uh, its dependence on uh, theta 1 and theta, uh, theta bar 2. So we, we, uh, we, we, we cannot lose any information if we 
consider n equals 1 projection of our superfield. n equals 1 projection means that we switch off second Grassmann value. So, for example, when, when, you consider, when we consider n equals 2 vector multiplet of field strengths, again familiar to you from the other theory, it's n equals 2 superfield, kind of. But, so, when you project it to uh, n equals 1 superspace, you get chiral superfield. So then we take a spinner derivative of W second spin derivative. We get uh, actually new object, n equals 1 field strength. When we compute two derivatives uh, with respect to the second Grassmann variable, we don't get anything new. But, so this term is new. In the case of Fayer-Sonius hyper, uh, we uh, just only the first step is sufficient. We, no inform new information is contained in spinning derivatives of Q. So, and now, okay, so the above was just, uh, well, the above uh, property, property mentioned was just part of information encoded here. Now, uh, so, uh, Okay, I take uh, n equals 1 projection of Q1, I call it phi plus, I can take n equals 2 projection of Q2, call it, call it of uh, Q bar 1, call it phi minus, so the other components are determined. Okay. And so about the remaining constraints tell us that phi plus is chiral and phi minus are chiral. So it's very nice because now we're well, basically Multiplet is described in terms of two arbitrary chiral superfields and n equal one superfield. And there is one more piece of information remaining. Uh, so, uh, 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 so this is the action of central charge on our superfield, n equal two superfield. And when we project down to n equal one superfield. Well, we see that uh, delta of phi plus is our uh, second order differential operator hitting phi bar minus and similar for phi minus. So central charge is completely determined. Now, uh, okay, uh, for your sonius hyper, uh, hyper multiplet formulated in terms of the, uh, in terms of n equals one superfields is well has very simple structure. Now, now uh, what about n equals two supersymmetry? Uh, we just play the same game. We start from a general uh, n equals to supersymmetric transformation law of any super. So u here is arbitrary. And, well, uh, so if we choose uh, epsilon 1 non vanishing and epsilon 2 vanishing, then we get just transformation of n equals 1 projection. So n equals 1 projections are just uh, of, well, n equals 1 projection of u is uh, n equals 1 superfield. This is what follows from definition. And uh, uh, so n equals 1 projections of q i and q bar i, that's n equals 1 superfield. But now, what about second transformation? Just let me take epsilon 1 0 and epsilon 2 just arbitrary. So I can, can well, compute, well, consider transformation of Q. Now, uh, you should keep in mind uh, the, well, that as uh, uh, covariant derivatives and supersymmetry uh, generators look very similar. When we take a second derivative and switch off, and switch off well, well, when we just when we switch off, uh, all, uh, 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 second Grassmann variables, um, so we can replace this uh, uh, expression by well, an expression involving spinner derivatives and extra term, explicitly theta dependent. It comes well, it's, well. It is a dependent term that is proportional to central charge. Now, uh, here we have, uh, uh, so far I was added. Now let me take I to be 1. And then make use of the constraints. 
So anytime I have D2 uh, hitting on uh, my super field, I can express in terms of D1, hitting difference. So, uh, so from here we can go to this expression. And uh, there still remain, remains one step to before we, sh we, we should insert the explicit expression for delta. And when we do that, we end up with the following transformation law. It was, uh, well, my calculation was for 5 plus, but the same calculation goes, uh, uh, goes for 5 minus. <coughs> So, and what you, you can see that, uh, okay, first of all, um, so we have d bar squared hitting uh, both right hand sides. Why? Because they just make uh, uh, d bar squared hitting <coughs> anything it gives chi approach. Yeah. So, uh, variations are chi as they should be. So, second uh, important point, um, so this expression on the right explicitly depends on theta. Uh, and uh, actually it's natural because first and second supersymmetries do not commute. They commute, uh, the commutator, well, commutator of first and second gives central charge. And one more uh, point we can learn from here. You see this part, I mean the first term doesn't de depend on W. W does not show up. And the second term is proportional to W. And I'm going to show that the second term is actually fake. You can you can delete it, uh, remove it completely, and it's necessary there only on just uh, to have the algebra closed. Now, uh, so uh, well, I have super uh, second supersymmetry transformation, and now I I, I, I can play uh, well a supersymmetry model building game. I can look for uh, invariant actions. So. Uh, in general, well, well free hypermultiplication involves, involves two pieces, kinetic term and mass term. So mass term, well, it's, it comes with complex parameter mu. Now, if you require that mass term, well, to be invariant under supersymmetry transformation given, then mu actually has to be related, well, has, cannot be arbitrary complex. It should be I times W times real mass. But, but we can just uh, play the same game with the kinetic term, but with, uh, in the case of kinetic term, let me do something different. Let me start with transformation law of this form. So, of course, I can just make, uh, I can choose the row as before. But uh, just let me keep a row arbitrary now and try just to, well, just to derive conditions on the row that just make the action invariant. So I, well, just I define transformation law of phi plus, of phi minus, and I, I just made it a action. So the first line I just uh, apply transformation. Second line I integrate by parts. Third line, one additional observation that derivative must hit rho. And then, after that, uh, I can see that if I restrict this parameter rho to obey this constraint, d bar d hit in row is zero, then the action is invariant. Why then? Because now I can reduce integral, well, I can do chiral integral. And uh, chiral in, when, when doing chiral integral, uh, well, second derivative, well, this new, well, I can do chiral integral using uh, general rule d for x, d to theta, d to theta bar of L is minus quarter d for x d to theta bar of oh, d to theta d bar squared. Now that was ah that was kind of thing of L. Yeah? So then I uh, well because of that property uh, well two derivatives go through d bar over bar. And so, well, phi bar is antichiral, d cannot hit phi, so d squared goes through, and d squared d bar acting on any antichiral superscript is zero. It's identity. Yeah? So the action is invariant. And now, 
So for the for kinetic term to be invariant, we need only that condition. And its general solution is here. And uh, there is piece that is very similar to the uh, supersymmetry transformation given before. Yeah. But there is one more piece. One more piece, side bar, and just arbitrary anti chiral super. So, what about these parameters? Tau generates central charge transformation, epsilon generates second SUSI, lambda, well, it's, it's spatial SU2 transformation. But, uh, so, it's, it's situation is really bizarre because we have, uh, well, it's just a theory, well, uh, theory of scalars and spinners. Should be no gauge invariant, but we have uh, arbitrary. Uh, we have transformation generated by parameter psi, which is arbitrary chiral superfield. So we have gauge invariance in our field. And it, we, we, there should be no physical gauge invariance. The resolution of that puzzle is very simple. The symmetry is trivial. So by trivial symmetry in field theory, people mean the following. Uh, so it's, uh, if field transforms this way, some matrix times equation of motion, and this matrix is anti-symmetric in the case of photonic fields, then uh, the symmetry is still because uh, it, is, it is not there on shell. Okay? When we just impose our fields to the equation of motion. So, so will you make the general ansatz for a, a second supersymmetry? Yes. Yeah. You could have included such yes. transformations. And, and that's basically, that basically the point. If we go back to here, so the second term is spatial side. I don't need that spatial side. Well, if I keep it, if I'm included, then uh, the algebra of transformation is very simple, but otherwise it just takes. Uh, now. Sorry, I don't, so understand, I don't understand your last statement. You said the trivial symmetry is the symmetry that's not there when you impose the equation of motion. Yeah. But when you impose the equation of motion, any variation is a symmetry. But transformation becomes well trivial. In the case of trivial symmetry, transformation become, becomes trivial. Field, the fields do not change. On shell, delta phi is zero. This is I don't mean that. Uh, well, of course, on shell, any any variation uh, of fields does not change the action. The action is stationary. What uh, what trivial symmetry? Well, by tri well, trivial property means that on shell delta phi is zero. Okay. So this is the equation of motion. But why you want a gamma to be anti-symmetric, which is arbitrary, wouldn't be still? Ah, no, no, because, because you want to have symmetry. Yeah. You, have, you want to have the action given where the delta S is S I gamma I J L J. Uh -huh. So you want, uh, uh, you, you want to have symmetry. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, so in, uh, well, what, what we learned that in a massive case we can choose psi any way we like. In 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 the massless case, in the massive case, we have to have spatial value. Okay, now, uh, uh, so you see, I started from formulation in terms of n equals two superfields. Then I will just switch to uh, n equals one superfields. Now, well, and I describe action in terms of n equals one superfields. Can we? Can you write down action? Uh, write down the action in n equals to super space. Yes, then we can. So Sonio suggests the following action principle. So uh, if you are well, using just n equals to super fields, we can construct multiplier being this constraint. It's called linear multiplier. This uh, name was coined by two years later by Breitenbach and Sonio. So and using such super field. Um, the, well, super invariant action has this, or we can rewrite it in terms of in n equals one. Two. <coughs> and for for Fayet-Sonius hypermultiplet, well, kinetic term you can show the kinetic term has this form, and mass term just another bilinear combination. So that's all about Fayet-Sonius hypermultiplet now. Uh, as I, well, I said at the very beginning that uh, sigma models are well, just described self, self interacting hypermodels. So far, I told you about free hypermodels. Now, I want to switch on interactions. 
There are two ways to proceed, starting from Piersonic. Look for consistent deformation of constraints and possibly for deformation of action. And second way, well, we just, we, we should keep, go, well, we, we, we should just, uh, well, the second approach, we just should stick to the description in terms of chaos effect. And look for a deformation of free supersynth transformation. And uh, after that, we, we should look for uh, invariant action. For super, well, sigma models action actions invariant under deformed transformation. So the first idea was never realized. So the second approach uh, turned out to be extremely powerful. And actually, the third approach uh, to uh, just abandon completely fire solids and look for a hypermultiplex without central charge. So third approach uh, will be covered uh, in the second lecture. Let me, allow, let me go to uh, describing the uh, second approach. So uh, now, finally I'm ready to talk about sigma models. So, uh, uh, well, any n equals 2 supersymmetric sigma model is particular n equals 1. We know the more general n equals 1 model. So in order to construct the most general uh, extended sigma model, we basically have to just start from this action and look for restrictions on target space geometry. That would just give us models possessing additional supersymmetry. So that pro this problem was solved by Hal Kalfit Kalfit Newton Rochik in 86. Uh, their paper was very tough, dense in terms of present the technical details. So my de well, I, I decided to include complete derivation and that derivation follow, follow my ideas in the work. So I start again like in the well, so I discuss massless fire solids. I started with transformation with undetermined row. So I look for second supersymmetry. To start with, let me look for transformation just well make the following answer. So rho is some parameter, rho and rho bar. Omega bar is just some function associated with a uh, target space. What I want of rho, I wanted to have um, uh, this, this piece. It is super simple, second super simple. If I have this term, I also must have that term. And there may be something else. So something else will be determined later. So why I need uh, the second? first piece if I have a second piece. The point is that if I apply two second supersymmetry transformations uh, and commute them with first supersymmetry transformation, I mean um, automatically end up with tau transformation, central charge transformation. So central charge transformation must be there. Okay. Uh, so what uh, uh, some, well, one assumption, very small assumption about rho and rho bar. They, uh, they must be algebraically independent. Okay, and then I just start wearing the action. <coughs> okay. uh, and it is like because they are algebraically independent, I can switch off rho and, well, keep rho bar transformation on. Okay, I vary the action, I integrate by parts. Uh, uh, obtain this expression. At this stage, at this stage, because I know that rho always include, includes tau, I, I make rho consider special case of constant parameter. After that, uh, after that, uh, this, this piece disappears. Yeah, I stay with this. And now I rewrite it in slightly different form. Well, so uh, I write it in this form. So this uh, little, well, this omega is uh, well, just the following co-positive omega bar. So what is important about this piece? It is symmetric in B bar C. So this will vanish if, if um, uh, omega bar is anti-symmetric. And this is the first implication. This is the first implication of n equals 2 <laughs> 
So the object introduced on the previous slide, this object, uh, is anti-symmetric. And actually, it is a two-form, globally defined two-form on target space. How can I see that? Well, it's reasoning very simple. So uh, the action has no super potential. So it must, it describes mass dynamics of mass and speed. So on shell, uh, first and second supersymmetry, supersymmetry transformation should realize n equals to super concrete algebra without, with, without central charge. So central charge transformation must be a trivial symmetry. Uh, but if I start with, uh, if I look at supersymmetry transformation and make use of this condition, so I end up with this. And on shell, on shell, delta phi must transform holomor well, as a holomorphic vector field in target space under representation. You cannot say, we cannot make any uh, statements uh, for off shell, well, about ge geometric properties of delta phi off shell. Because off shell, we can always have trivial symmetries. But on shell, delta phi must be well defined. So, uh, so this object, this object must, well, must be tensor field, and therefore omega must be also tensor field. And now, uh, so now, now we can make use of the result obtained and come back to the general variation. And general variation simplifies. So far, transformation parameter rho is assumed to have this form. Central charge, second supersymmetry plus something. Now I put forward additional restriction. D bar of rho bar is constant. And general solution of this is epsilon bar plus psi. Psi is arbitrary chiral superfield. And this arbitrary chiral superfield doesn't show up. So, and for the action to be invariant, we have to uh, well, so this functional, this functional must vanish identical. So what is this functional? Well, it just uh, this omega bar that appears in transformation, kerametric, and first derivative of phi bar. And of course, we know that we have trivial symmetry. Okay, now we have to understand the implication of that condition. And so this object psi alpha must vanish identical. In particular, if I vary it with respect to phi or phi bar, it should be also zero. So let me vary psi with respect to phi bar. And if I do that, I get this. And what I see that uh, this does not vanish identically only if dub uh, omega bar is uh, covariantly constant or holomorphic. The omega bar is anti-holomorphic. So if this condition holds, if this condition holds, then uh, well, what I can do chiral integral and uh, well make use of the same pro same property. Omega bar is anti-chiral field, delta phi bar anti-chiral. So d squared go through hit d bar of phi bar. And this creates the bar of any anti is zero. So a uh, second condition is that uh, omega BC, the form in the two form in the identity form, must be holomorphic. And then uh, there is an identity that uh, was uh, in, uh, discovered by Richard von Unge. So you, you can start with, so just suppose, just suppose we don't have that condition that omega is in C. As we can start from this combination. And I write it in terms of covariant derivatives and Christophers. And again. Yeah. So this is identity. Just you can check that it's just identity. But now if we just if we recall that omega is antisymmetric, last line is zero. It means this term is zero. It means that covariant derivative uh, d bar of omega bar must be. So uh, uh, omega bar is annihilated by all target space uh, covariant derivatives. It means uh, this two form is covariantly 
constant and therefore our target space is manifold of restricted holonomy. Now, uh, uh, <coughs> but of course you, you could have derived that condition just by analyzing a uh, condition that uh, psi alpha dot is zero. So if you compute honestly that object and there will be terms involved in this combination and you have to impose, uh, impose this condition in order to uh, in order to kill those terms. Okay, uh, we have uh, <coughs> obtained a lot of <coughs> structure now. We, well, we, we still have our main problem. We have to show that uh, this guy is identically zero. Yeah, for that we need uh, the well, uh, property that omega is covalently constant. And, uh, well, it means that annihilated by all derivatives. So, well, it's a uh, uh, Riemann tensor and omega know about each other. They talk to each other. And talking uh, to each other in such a way that this combination is a uh, completely symmetric in ACD, in undotted indices. Now, uh, so uh, so next uh, uh, next step is a bit technical. So I uh, uh, well. Uh, Psi was given a superspace integral. Now let me do uh, 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 one Grassmann integral followed by another Grassmann. So two Grassmann, well, in this order. Uh, why this order? Because uh, this expression, expression can be expressed in terms of anticholomorphic two form. And D, so remaining two derivatives. They don't just uh, um, uh, because omega bar is antichiral, so d squared goes through. I mean, they are, uh, omega bar is annihilated by uh, any d. So now uh, there is some calculation, uh, and uh, so you can show that uh, the expression we have can be given in this form. And then uh, we can recall definition of Riemann tensor, and we end up with two combinations, two terms uh, in the expression of psi. And so both terms vanish because of others. Because of this. So, okay, uh, properties obtained uh, make sure that the action is in there. Now, now, uh, uh, now, I can collect the results. Uh, so the action is invariant under such transformation. So this uh, omega bar appearing in transformation is related to currently constant to form uh, uh, defined on target space. The relationship is this, and omega is anti. Is currently constant. Uh, uh, so the action is uh, invariant, but uh, we have to make sure that it's actually um, uh, this transformation uh, form n equals to <coughs> super Pankare algebra on shell. So we have to commute two, well, uh, two different super, uh, uh, two second supersymmetries. We have to commute. <coughs> first and second supersymmetries and just to make sure that uh, we get right uh, mutation relation. So this is easy problem. So you just do trivial calculation. And the result of analysis is that uh, the algebra holds on shell E this matrix omega bar or more precise with derivatives. So omega bar squared is minus one. So this property specific for complex structure. Uh, now, uh, okay. Uh, so previous, uh, all previous results can be uh, written in slightly different form. So we started uh, from Kelly manifold. In doubt, well, there is a nature defined complex structure. I call it J three. It is diagonal in the variables phi, phi bar I use. So 
the fact uh, the presence of a uh, currently constant uh, two form uh, with properties given means that we have two more currently constant <laughs> complex structures J1 and J2 given in terms of derivatives of omega bar and omega and all these three guys well we have three currently constant complex structures so target space is created with respect to each of them and they form quaternionic algebra it means that target space is quadratic. so so far uh, okay n equals to supersymmetry requires n equals to supersymmetry requires hypercalic geometry um, uh, so far the only uh, object that was not completely geometric well, this guy, omega, omega bar. Uh, so in here, uh, its derivatives are well, the, well, its derivative is geometric object, but not omega bar itself. And actually, it can be chosen in this form. So capital omega bar is lowercase omega times derivative of credit potential, and uh, so the reason we can do that, uh, you can check that uh, uh, well, its derivatives, its derivatives exactly to give homomorphic uh, to form and homomorphic to form. And the reason, uh, the reason uh, for for this choice is that we uh, we, still, we have Kelly invariants. Kelly potential is the final to Kelly transformation and. Uh, omega will change under such transformations, but not supersymmetric. Supersymmetric transformation is very transformation. Okay, and now, uh, now uh, let's just uh, we, we should recall a uh, situation with Fayet-Sonius hypermultiplet. With Fayet, with Fayet-Sonius uh, hypermultiplet, we needed that piece in order to have closed algebra. So for sigma models, for sigma models, we basically <coughs> a second supersymmetry transformation was realized the way uh, it was done in 1986. Uh, so second supersymmetry described by just choosing raw bar to the epsilon bar theta. But now we can just combine this transformation with a trivial, with spatial gauge, trivial gauge transformation like a bugger action did a few years ago and uh, so I mean this combination differs from uh, uh, the one uh, P in Fayet-Sonius case by just uh, W uh, uh, W is special now W is equal to I can, because I can just give W any value I can choose it to be equal to 1 and now, uh, well, what they notice, I mean, they actually were interested in five-dimensional story. And in five dimensions, um, so combination that nature like chaos is exactly this. But what they notice is that, uh, so second supersymmetry transformations form closed al algebra of shell. If we define transformations this way. But then they say, well, a uh, commutator of first and second transformation does not close. Option. And there is only half of truth in that story because actually uh, first and second supersymmetry transformations form closed algebra with central charge. Uh, central charge uh, is zero on shell, but of shell it is there. And so although we work in terms of n equals 1 superfields, we have off shell n equals 2 supersymmetry. Of course, in the sense, well, that supersymmetry get, gets deformed. Central charge becomes zero also. But otherwise, otherwise, uh, it is off shell. Now, uh, you remember I started by, well, just, uh, I tried to explain why uh, we should worry about formulation in terms of n equals 1 super, super fields. We have minimal uh, set of auxiliaries, formulation is geometric, so geometric just is encoded, geometry is encoded with credit uh, potential. And third point, it is option. 
Now, uh, uh, so uh, formulation in terms of n equals one su superfield is nice, but uh, it just exists in theory. A like formulation in terms of component fields. You cannot use a formulation in order to ge generate new manifold. In order to construct this small, uh, well, uh, the action we, we need a Kelly, poten Kelly potential or hyper Kelly. Moment. But we do want to uh, 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 to have uh, 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 we do want to have formulation that would allow us to generate hyperkalement, and for that we need uh, n equals two superspace T. Um, uh, so it was realized uh, in the early eighties that uh, if you work with multiplets in standard n equals n equals two superspace. Uh, uh, it's no good. But if you work in terms of uh, of shell multiplets, uh, like uh, improved tensor multiplet, uh, 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 relax uh, hyper multiplet, we cannot we cannot succeed. We cannot generate arbitrary sigma. So uh, uh, and in a resolution of that uh, 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 no goal theorem uh, basically was that uh, following. We have to look for extension of standard n equals to superspace by Lister like bosonic variables. And correct superspace setting was found in mid 80s, and that is story for tomorrow. Any questions for Sergei? Sergei, I have a question. Uh, so suppose I start from a hypermultiple is target space flat R for N, just in the simplest case. And then instead of uh, trying to understand what are deformations of the metric, like what a hyperparallel metric on the space, which, which would allow me to write N plus 2 supersymmetry, I'm asking, uh, I still want to have a flat target space R for N. But uh, I would allow high derivative terms in the Lagrangian and supersymmetry transformations. Is there uh, a systematic way to? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You cannot high derivative terms. Mm -hmm. And is there a systematic way to say what are all possible Lagrangian? Yeah, this is the beauty of uh, super space. Mm -hmm. You just uh, you just construct it. Just um, and you can. Uh, Lagrangian is essentially arbitrary function. Uh, can Lagrangian may be arbitrary function of a super. Okay. And, the and just the power of the function, the degree of the function would be uh, the degree of derivatives. Right? It, 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 it varies. For example, for example, if you uh, okay, it's just uh, example. If it is about vector multiple. So I mean, uh, all people will just you know that from that theory. Right. Zabit uh, can theory that low energy action is uh, is homotopy potential. Mm -hmm. And some people say that it's a uh, complete low uh, low energy effective action. But it's very low low energy effective action because there are high derivatives. Mm -hmm. And high derivative terms um, they come with a uh, integration over full super. Uh -huh. And then this is function of uh, it's no no longer holomorphic. So here we have four derivatives. But if you if you if you need uh, uh, eight derivatives, if you if you need eight terms with eight derivatives, you you add well basically uh, you replace this function by function with d to the four, d bar to the four, and so on of all superfields. Uh -huh. There is, uh, I mean, if uh, okay, if, uh, I mean, for example, if you consider n equal four superfields and you you want your action to be super conformal, they just uh, family or uh, high derivative super conformal invariants. Uh, say this a derivative, l derivative, whatever. Why well, we describe that in paper? 
but it, it depends on on, uh, on what on, on, on you. Well, it's much more difficult in the case of hyper. Because for hyper, I was asking about hyper. I mean, my original question was about hyper. You, uh, it's, 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 but it's still possible, right? You can write well. You can. There is no problem to write high derivatives term, but there is problem uh, that uh, derivatives may hit a gear with superfluid. Then you. Uh, there will be trouble to limit axis, but it's an, uh, well, that problem is the same as for a uh, higher multi pair dynamical run mm -hmm. You see, when, when, uh, for example, in the dynamical run super symmetry, you have uh, a contribution that comes after a Keller potential, uh, where it's something like the d alpha phi squared uh, d bar phi bar and some function of phi phi uh -huh. It's for derivative. And it does appear when you uh, compute low, uh, low energy fifty-fifty. But uh, now you have derivatives of derivative fields. And uh, uh, then the elimination of auxiliary fields is a bit more problematic, but in, in the case of effective action, uh, well, you just, you know that, uh, well, you can eliminate auxiliary in perturbation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So for n equals 4, you have a classification of deformations which preserve n equals 4 super conformal n equals 2. N equals 2. There is no oh. self formulation for n equals 4. So you just realize n equals 4 super means in n equals 2. If you realize it in equals to superspace and then you preserve how many super conformals charges like six uh, uh, you preserve n equals two super conformal groups. Super conformal yeah. Okay. So it's like eight uh Poincare, eight Qs yeah. and yeah. eight S's. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh good, good. Yeah. So maybe I'll ask for details. Okay. After. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, if not, let thanks again. And so next talk it's